also hear about ice cores. Uh, I know what an ice cube is. Tell, tell me what an ice core is. <laughs> an ice core. <laughs> All right. Well, the geoscience community has been uh, uh, the group, the people that are predominantly glaciologists, but they're interested in, in uh, monitoring climate. An ice core, the most famous ice cores that the ones I'll talk about now, are ice cores that have been drilled in Greenland through the ice sheet. And that ice sheet is about two miles thick. And so two different teams uh, over the years, over the decades, four or five different ice cores have been drilled from the surface of the summit of the Greenland ice sheet down to bedrock. And I'll talk about two predominantly. One was done by an American team and one was doing, done by a European team. So it is drilling down through the ice and examining the ice cores. And it's possible to distinguish some differences between summer and winter because in the summertime, the ice has hoarfrost on the surface because of the shining of the sun on it. And there's more deposition of say dust in the summertime. And in the winter time, of course, each winter on average, there's going to be some snow that falls on it. So it increases the amount of snow. And so uh, gradually the snow builds up because of the winter snowfall. Well, that ends up showing light and dark patterns down through the ice. So the geologists that are up working on the ice and they recover the ice cores, they do a preliminary count of observing the counting of those summer winter cycles back in time. And I had the privilege of visiting with one of the leaders in this effort. He's a Christian geologist and he's at Penn State University. His name is Richard Alley. And I asked him, how far back in time did you feel that you could count those summer winter ice layers with your eyeball? Because deep in the ice, the annual layers get thinner and thinner and thinner and they can't be observed with the naked eye. And he said they felt they could go back with the naked eye about 50,000 years. Beyond that, and well, even including in the more recent rocks, but particularly on down below what you can observe. They also put in an electrode and they measure the resistivity and they measure chemical properties in the ice cores to be able to do the counting mode in time before when you can see the, the layering. Is there a way to independently confirm that these numbers, uh, it's kind of like with the carbon 14 with the tree rings, is there a way with ice cores to say that this, this dark layer con conforms with this uh, I mean, pass yeah. or timing? Is, yeah. there a way, is there a way to do that? Well, and that's a critical part of the process because any of us, you know, you're thinking about storms, you know, some winters there may not be much snow or there might be a couple of different layers that accidentally get formed. So the earliest part of the data that was counted, there were disparities and the error bars were fairly large. They had, uh, of course, the European team was doing the counting and the American team was doing counting and they did their best to you know, put the two together. But since those early days, geologists have also taken the ice and they melt the ice away and left behind through that green, through those Greenland ice cores there are some little shards, little pieces of, of uh, say, rock fragments. It's called tephra, <laughs> okay? It's a, it's a geologic term, it's tephra. It's volcanic ash that has fallen at various times because of the volcanoes that are there uh, on the islands close to in Northern Europe and uh, from Iceland or from, um, yeah, from Iceland, there's some volcanoes that have erupted and you remember a couple of years ago, there was a huge eruption and it affected the airplane traffic, air, uh, traffic across the North Atlantic. So the geoscience community has collected those tephras at many different depths down through, the, um, down through the ice cores and they identify where that 
what volcano that came from, and then they do radiometric dating on those volcanoes. So there are about uh, 30 different tephras down through from 10,000 years on down to 100,000 years of these tephras that they use as, as a cross check to help pin down where we are. And the radiometric dating error bars of numbers that I, of some that I looked at are approximately 6% of the age. So for instance, at 40,000 years old, an error bar would be that's plus or minus 1,500 years. So it's, that, that's about the error bar in, uh, in the radiometric dating tools that we use uh, to do those confirmations. You know, you mentioned error bars a couple of times. In general, what are error bars? Okay. Any measurement we make uh, in the laboratory has uh, limitations in terms of the physical technology of doing the process. Uh, let me use an analogy of walking, okay? If I tried to get the distance to downtown Tulsa by pacing it off and walking that distance, it's something like 13 miles, I might get down there and I might I might have an error of plus or minus a mile just because of not knowing uh, the length of the pace that I was doing the walking. But if I drove my car and drove down there using the car, uh, the odometer on the car, I'd get a much better number with less error bars, say 13 plus or minus two tenths of a mile. Or if we use the laser light and shown it from my house downtown, we could get an error of just, you know, a centimeter. So that's the sense of error bars, and that's in a percentage, typically. So when I say, you know, this uh, piece of igneous rock and this radiometric age is 40,000 years with an error of about 6%, so that is saying that uh, it's from about uh, 25, between 25, uh, See, 40,000 years, subtract 1,500 and add 1,500, okay, uh, years. So, so 38.5 to 41. Yeah, 38.5 to 41.5. Yeah. That, that's the concept of error bars. Okay. Are they sometimes, is that pretty consistent? Are they sometimes larger or smaller? They can be larger or smaller depending on the circumstances of the physical measurement. Um, some of the radiometric dating methods now are getting those fine-tuned down to one to two percent uh, and it depends on the quality of the sample the number of samples that are done and the nature of the particular radioactive isotope that's being used but i i have a tendency to always to want to express the larger error bars just for truthfulness in making my presentations i don't mind that the actual value is is tighter than that, but I want to give the flexibility of uh, flexibility that this is reasonable. It might be better than this, but this covers the dominant range. So getting back specifically to the ice layers and the formation, yeah. how do we, you, you, I think you kind of alluded to this, you, you believe it's consistent, you know it's consistent because you can cross-reference to outside sources such as the volcanic ash? Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, you may have already mentioned this. Uh, how far back does this kind of dating take us? Okay. For the sake of, uh, for our purposes here, the ice cores in Greenland go back uh, to about 100 or 110,000 years. The challenge is down at depth on top of bedrock, that ice does not behave like the ice cube in your kitchen because it's under two miles of ice it behaves more like a thick heavy play-doh so it slowly thins out and it slowly flows out toward the coasts so down above bedrock there's a fair bit of uncertainty as they seek to identify the ice core layer in there but to about 90 to 100,000 years, it's pretty good. Then it gets questionable. But certain, certainly not within a typical young Earth parameter. 
Uh, no, no. Okay, so ICE has been around for a while then. ICE has been around for a while. We can talk about Antarctica because Antarctica shows uh, four different glacial maxima that have happened over the last 420,000 years. So there the process of getting the age is more complicated because that's such a dry climate. There are other methods that we need to use and understand to get the, the age of that. Hmm. Well, getting towards a more biblical question. Yeah. Do you believe that the Noah's flood was local or that it covered the whole world? Well, from, from my perspective, I think from both biblical reasons and for geological reasons, uh, I, believe it, I believe it was local. And here, here's where I, here's my thinking. Uh, in Genesis six through nine, it describes basically the floodwaters as rising, 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 and then basically receding. So it's described basically as one predominantly cycle, all right? What we actually find in nature is that in any area where we're studying the geology, we find that sea level has risen and then lowered, and risen and lowered. Some of the reasons are because of the glacial cycles that I've just mentioned briefly. Other reasons are because of plate tectonics. So for example, when India crashed into Asia, that was dramatically lifting up the rocks up to higher elevation. So that's one factor. The second factor um, is in the Gulf of Mexico, there's 40,000 feet of sediment piled up in the Gulf of Mexico. And if that in fact happened in say about a half a year as it described as described in, in Genesis, that would mean 150 to 200 feet of sediment would have to be deposited every day of that year. So geologically that just doesn't fit. Uh, another example that doesn't fit is um, limestones are made up of shells and seashells. And even if all the seashells that happen, that occur on the face of the earth today or at one point of time, they just couldn't possibly account for all the uh, many, many different limestone layers that we, fly, that we find in the geologic record. Another factor is in the sedimentary record, we have salt deposits. And the only way we're aware that salt forms, the logical way that salt forms, is by extensive evaporation of seawater in a restricted basin that causes salt to deposit. And we have uh, several thousand feet of salt that's in the northern portion of the Gulf of Mexico down at depth. Offshore Brazil, there's about a mile thick of salt down in the basin there. And likewise, thousands of feet of salt over offshore West Africa, Angola, etc. So those are reasons that a global flood, uh, the geology just does not fit uh, a, glo a, a global flood. So that brings us back to a local flood. Do you want to ask the question about those before I talk about uh, a local flood in the Middle East? Well, it's been said that some of the sedimentary rock beds extend from the U.S. to Europe. Uh, do you think that that would better fit a global flood? Well, the extension across continents is, I would say, best wording is highly questionable <laughs> because the nature of the way um, North America separated from Africa and Europe, that most of the geology of North America for the last 180 million years has been um, totally, totally separated from Europe. So even though the sandstones look similar, uh, 
and they can cover many states. I'm not convinced that they actually have full continuity across the whole way across our continent. They're different, they're different, they're of different ages and different time frames. For example, the sediments that are in the Grand Canyon, uh, the Coconino sandstone was deposited, say, over about four or five states, uh, maybe coming up a bit toward uh, um, up to northern Utah, but not the whole way across to the um, to the uh, Appalachians in Pennsylvania. A book that I read here that I'm going to sh show as as a con content. Okay, it's called The Lost World of the Flood. It's written by Tremper Longman and John Walton. And the context is that they're looking at scripture in terms of uh, understanding the nature of the literature that's in the scripture as describing, describing the flood. And what we do know and the context of what they describe is that there are clearly flood stories that go back before there was writing, okay? So the, the idea of, a, of catastrophic flooding is in almost all, all cultures around the world. And we have geological evidence that catastrophic floods have happened in a couple of different ways. One example is we have evidence that the Black Sea, which, uh, had, which is a deep depression in, in there in, in Eastern Europe, it's a deep depression, and there was a time that the Mediterranean Sea was low enough that seawater did not keep coming into the Black Sea. And so the Black Sea area was a, was a deep depression with freshwater lakes down at depth. Well, a group of scientists from Columbia University investigated the timing of when sea level was rising in the Mediterranean and it came through that Dardanelle space and flowed down into the Black Sea. And so whatever people were living down there at the time, the Black Sea was going to end up rising, rising, rising. Uh, you know, not catastrophically in the same sense of, of Noah's flood, but it flooded out those peoples. And that happened about 7,500 years ago. So there was one example that, you know, culturally people in that part of the world would be hearing about catastrophic flooding. The same is true in the Persian Gulf. 15,000 years ago, when we were still on the end of the last ice age, sea level was low enough that the Tigris and Euphrates rivers flowed the whole way down to the Arabian Peninsula and out to the Indian Ocean at the Gulf of Oman. Hmm. And so the Persian Gulf 15,000 years ago did not exist as we know it today. So if there were humans living down along that river, when sea level began to rise in the melting of the last ice age, gradually the water came in over that sill at Oman, that Gulf of Aden, filled up the Persian Gulf, and eventually by 6,000 years ago, it came the whole way up, forming the Persian Gulf and up to north of where Kuwait is today. So that was a flooding scenario in that part of the world. So although we can't sort out and know which flood might be, you know, God used uh, for the events that he described in scripture, I completely am convinced that whatever God has written in scripture would fit whatever we may or may not be able to understand of when when that flood happened, which I believe happened in the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley. I know that Hugh Ross has said that for his understanding is that the universal flood meant universal for all humankind, that all the humans and the animals in relationship with humans were killed, except for Noah and the families uh, on the ark, and that that wiped out all of mankind at that point. Is that kind of what you're getting at? That's what I'm getting at, and that's what I think. I have the context that uh, in some, some of my Bible reading about six months ago, I noted there's only, there are only about seven generations between Adam and Noah. Hmm. 
And so I'm thinking, well, where did these people live? After the Tower of Babel, they were not prone to move, and God was disappointed that they were told to spread out around the world, and they didn't. Well, if the same thing happened between Adam and Noah, uh, wherever Adam was and the Garden of Eden was, could very well be fairly close to where Noah uh, lived at that time in the southern part of the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley. I tend to think also and remember the huge flooding that happened in Houston when we had uh, five feet of water mm. from rainfall that happened over about four, five, six, seven days. And that made five feet of water. Well, if, if God flooded the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley with rainfall at that, say, at that same rate that happened in Houston, that would end up producing 30 feet of rainfall in that Tigris-Euphrates River Valley back in the days of Noah. So God could use the natural processes that he have of rainfall by directing the rain and springs because the fountains of the deep sprung up it said also in, in Genesis. So I see that that's a reasonable, at least a, a better interpretation than worldwide because geology just doesn't work worldwide. We do find some thick layers of flood deposits uh, south of Baghdad. Most of them are just a foot or two, but there's several been discovered. One, one, one that's discovered is about eight feet thick that has some radiocarbon dating about 4,900 uh, 4, years ago. Another example down there has uh, 11 feet thick of, a catas of flooding. So that valley has been noted for flooding um, over ancient history that's, that's there in that part of the world. But how, how do you deal with the part of the text that describes the flood as lasting a year? Well, um, Think about um, this. This probably is not a very satisfactory solution, and maybe we will. But I'm thinking about the context of the southern part of that Tigris Euphrates River Valley is incredibly flat, hmm. and it is so flat that south of Baghdad, the, the gradient of the slope of the Tigris Euphrates rivers is only about four inches per mile mm. and then down toward the Persian Gulf the current gradient is only about an inch and a half per mile so this is flat 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 so how much water was there and why it lasted that long this isn't a very suitable explanation but if God dumped enormous amounts of water into that valley, it would take a long time to dissipate. And that's about the best that I feel we can do. Mm. I do notice, I did uh, also had uh, read, some of my reading, uh, someone did the analysis of say, from the curvature of the earth, uh, how far could Noah see uh, out at a distance, say to see highlands or something like that. Well, from the topography, that is typically in that area of the southern part of the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley, north of what's now Kuwait. They couldn't see anything beyond about 20 miles, okay? Because the, because the curvature of the earth would cover everything while the, while the ark was there floating. And even if there was a mountains like 1,500 feet that are bordering the, the foothills of the Zagros Mountains over in Iran or west in, in Saudi Arabia. They couldn't see, they wouldn't be able to even see those beyond about, uh, about 40 or 50 miles, whereas those are 80 miles away to the east and something like 50 to 60 miles away to the west. So they were out apparently, if, you know, if they're along the Euphrates River, which seems to be where mankind was living in those, at that time period, um, it truly was, and the whole earth was covered from everything that they could see. And as we know, the Bible also tends to use hyperbole terminology in describing events that, uh, for theological reasons, 
in the book, The Lost World of the Flood, uh, Tremper Longman and John Walton make the really strong point that we should be remembering the flood for its theological reasons and, and purposes and not be so worried, not, you know, the, the primary emphasis there is theological, not, not what the science is of, a, of the flooding process. So why, why didn't the people just move somewhere else when the local flood started? Well, the distance they had to go, they didn't, remember the people were described as they didn't want to move. Mm. You know, they were stationary and it was described as um, they were going about their business and the flood came. So they weren't, they weren't prone to be moving. It came so fast. Okay. Uh, flooding the valley, it came so fast they couldn't. Well, for my scientific apologetic students, the question is, what do you think is the single greatest issue facing scientific apologetics today? Uh, it was probably what you read from, from uh, St. Augustine. Mm. Exactly that. that. That covers it better than I could say it. Uh, specific interpretations ruling over well-attested information. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I would next, obviously the follow-up question is how do you approach that issue? And I think you've already answered that throughout the last hour. Well, I tried it. I want to be sure that I speak the truth, things that I can back up with evidence. Mm. And I want to do it as gently and patiently as I can, recognizing that so many people do not have exposure to creation story through geology and geochemistry as I've had the opportunity over the last 50 years. And that's why I'm called into this and pleased to be able to do so. So finally, do you have any advice for the scientific apologetic students in my class? Well, um, Please tr seek to keep an open mind, recognizing that God's word and God's world um, necessarily need to fit together smoothly and in harmony. And I can offer a book to help in that process. Uh, my colleague, Greg Davidson, has written a book called Friend of Science, Friend of Faith. And the subtitle is uh, Listening to God in His works and in his world and it works and his word so that's one the other i have to mention because i'm a co-author of it is the grand canyon monument to an ancient earth and that's the one that we use to uh, describe and address the issues in the grand canyon covering radiometric dating the age of the rocks the sediments the type of sediments and our subtitle of the book is can noah's flood explain the grand canyon so we're seeking to invite the students to come in and use this to look at the data for themselves and listen. There are eight of us who are evangelical Christians and scientists who co-authored this book. We have had a few people who are not in the faith community because of their specialties, but they were willing to cooperate with us. And we wrote this book expressly for the church uh, to address these kind of questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, Ken, for being on the show today, for your knowledge, for your devotion, for your humility. Thank you so much, and I, I hope not just my students in the class, but the people watching this later on the show will, will learn much from you. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate being here. It's uh, the highlight of my June. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that means much, but uh, you're very welcome. <laughs> well, it means a lot to me because... This is what the Lord has called me into, so it does mean a lot. Well, th thank you for contacting me and setting this up. And thank you.